So I'd like to kick things off. Um, I would just present very briefly a uh, kind of a quick set of ideas about how this fits into the broader scheme of what I've been working on um, for a little while now, which is this whole notion of seeing around corners and how can we be more, um, how can we think more broadly, be more mindful of the possibilities that face us when we're in these really unprecedented moments. So I'll start off with this idea of an inflection point. And those of you know who my work know that an inflection point is something that exerts a 10x force on your business. It changes your assumptions in some radical way. And I think it's really important to remember that when you're in the midst of an inflection point, you don't get to go steady state. <laughs> you don't. It changes things. So you're either going to benefit from it and really succeed, or it's going to take your business into some kind of decline, or it's a combination of the two. So Ron and I were just talking to um, a potential client the other day, um, and this is a company that has absolutely thrived throughout the pandemic. And as the pandemic begins to look as though it's coming to a logical conclusion, they're kind of scratching their heads and saying, okay, how are we adding value? You know, once the products that we offer are no longer in such high demand, uh, anybody who's in paint and lumber and, you know, all the supplies for spare rooms, uh, you know, those, those businesses are going to be facing a very different environment than they had faced. So I think the core thing to remember about inflection points is you don't, you don't get the option of staying where you are. They're either going to take you up or they're going to take you in a different direction. And that's really what we wanted to talk about today, which is how do we think strategically as we move through this uh, of what's going to be different. So the first principle for really thinking differently about the future is looking at the concept of what kind of indicators are we paying attention to as we think about what's coming. And the first big observation I would make is that there are three kinds of indicators. Lagging indicators, great information about stuff that's already happened. You can't change a lagging indicator. Um, and unfortunately for a lot of organizations, they're fixated on lagging indicators. So things like, you know, how did we do this quarter is a question that comes up sometimes. Well, as, as anybody who's in a forward looking company will tell you the results we got this quarter were baked, you know, maybe two years, even three years ago. So it's a lagging indicator. It's not a bad thing to measure. It's just that it's not going to help you when you look at the future. Then we have current indicators, and those are useful, right? Things like employee engagement, um, how hard is it to hire people? Um, you know, where do we think where do we think we need to be investing in um, better net promoter scores? Those kind of things. They kind of tell you where you are. It's like the the speedometer in your car. How fast are you going? The hardest thing to get a hold of are leading indicators. And that's what I really want to focus our conversation today on, which is what are the plausible things we want to have in our minds strategically as we think about where we're headed? And this brings me to the uh, early warnings model. Uh, I talk about it in the book, Seeing Around Corners, but it, it, it's this reality we all have to deal with as strategists is that the changes that are going to be super important for us begin as very weak signals, right? The strength of the signal is not that strong. And then slowly, slowly, then they start picking up steam, right? So you get this sort of gradually and then suddenly phenomenon. And then finally, when you get to what I call time zero, the inflection point is upon us. We know what it means. We've got facts, right? We understand what's happening now. Um, the trouble is if you wait till then to make a strategic choice, it's late. It's too late because in strategy, you've always got another line. The degree of strategic freedom that you have is inversely related to the strength of the signals that you have to work with. It's one of the fundamental frustrations of being a strategist, right? By the time you know what the right answer is, it's too late. Um, and so our challenge when we're dealing with this kind of dynamic is how do we move our decision processes back from time zero to what I call the period of optimal warning, which is that period in the middle where you've got enough confidence in the signals that you can start to make sense of them, uh, but it's not so late that everybody else has figured it out as well, and there's no strategic advantage to be uh, gained. So how do we do this? So a very practical way to do this is we posit some time zero events that we want to be thinking about, you know, plausible 
events that could happen uh, in the future that we want to be monitoring. And then we work backward in time from those events and ask the question, for that to happen, what would have to be true? What would have to be in the case? Um, and, and I think it's a very interesting moment to be thinking about uh, these time zero events. Now, a couple of notes on early warnings. Do not confuse your preferences with predictions. And this, I think, is something we all fall into. Um, you know, we, we would like a certain future to evolve, so that's the one we plan for, and that's the one we think about, and that's the one we embrace. Unfortunately, as Gary Hamill's very fond of saying, the future is remarkably indifferent to your preferences. So you really need to be opening your mind to what happens if, you know, this doesn't happen. What's our plan B? Is our strategy robust to multiple possible futures? And we've seen an awful lot of corporate disasters where this wasn't the case. And, you know, a very commonly known one is General Electric, which essentially doubled down a huge bet on the fossil fuel scenario being dominant for energy in a world where the price of renewables was dropping like a rock. And they locked themselves into a fixed asset future, and that's not what happened. In fact, it was only one of several possible futures that they could have been planning for. So you want to watch out for that. So here what we're thinking about is a couple of time zero events that are uh, potentially really important. So let's not just focus on the events we prefer. Let's also recognize that the benefit of a leading indicator is not necessarily whether what it predicted came true. In fact, some of the most powerful leading indicators I've ever seen are those where it was so profound and so strong that the thing it predicted never happened because we prepared. So what a leading indicator is there for is, is mental and organizational preparedness about a future time zero event. So here we are. It is uh, June of 2021. And we're you know, getting ready to get back out there, right? Uh, New York and California have just announced no restrictions. We're opening up. The city's jammed. You can't get a restaurant reservation in New York for love or money. Uh, people are out in the streets. People are talking about you know, reviving live performances. Uh, theaters are playing to packed audiences. And, you know, as far as a lot of people are concerned, we're done. That chapter is over. We're going to go live our lives. And the question you have to ask yourself is, okay, you know, that's a preference. Let's go do that. But in terms of time zero events, let's think about, let's think about nine months from now, nine months from now. So I want you to think forward to March of 2022, which is about two years after the world shut down. And I'm going to take two time zero events. Time zero event number one is masks off. No problem. The newspaper headline that would go like that is March 15th, you know, in, in, a, in a fantastic combination of public health moves, availability of vaccines, the triumph of science, um, the world reopened safely. That might be the headline, right? There is a future I would not prefer which is masks off big problem. And what that time zero looks like is, you know, pockets of recurrence, um, pockets of spikes. You know, you, you, you pin your annual year on a conference that you're planning in Cincinnati and two weeks before the conference, you have an outbreak. What do you do? Um, and so, you know, I think we need to be thinking about what are the early warnings we want to be paying attention to, because certainly over the globe, the pandemic has not left us. In fact, there have been more deaths so far in 2021 globally than there were in all of 2020. So my question for those participating and for Ron to kick off the discussion is how robust are our strategies in each of those time zero scenarios? And what are the early warnings we might encourage people to be looking for? So before we try to turn it over to conversation, I just wanted to also say um, we have resources for you. So Ron and I are working in an organization called Valise, which I founded a few years ago, to go from, you know, great thoughts and ideas to really tools and taking action and being willing to move forward, um, you know, with practical things that you can use to bring strategy under uncertainty, to make innovation mastery graspable and so forth. So um, when I wrote Discovery Driven Growth together with Ian McMillan, we invented a thing called the bare bones net present value calculator. And that's essentially a pretty fancy spreadsheet that allows you to use nine input variables to basically measure the or estimate the, the value of a project. And it's very useful for people in working in organizations for whom everything has to be accompanied by a spreadsheet. <laughs> so, um, so if you're interested, you can go to the Belize.com website, 
click on the resources tab. You can download it for free, play around with it. And the great thing about that is if you're having another kind of conversation where somebody says, well, I don't think your advantage is going to last that long. You're like, fine, put in your numbers and let's see what happens. You know, it can be the, the, a great way to get some clarity around what are the assumptions we're actually making. We also have a lot of articles. We've got videos which go on the valise.com deeper dive, um, as well as uh, a LinkedIn newsletter that I have and Ron also posts quite often on LinkedIn. We publish articles. They come out every Tuesday. Uh, you can subscribe on LinkedIn. We have, I have a monthly newsletter that I publish. Um, you can also find both of us on Twitter, uh, on YouTube, and Fireside Chats, which is what we're doing uh, today, although this is a little bit different format. So uh, that's us. Uh, you can find us at Belize.com. Uh, and with that, I will stop sharing, turn it over to chat, and uh, let's, see what, let's see what people want to talk about. So Rita, just a, um, a comment. Frank has asked the question of a concrete example of kind of um, early warnings model. Um, the, the example that we've put out here is that there's some point in the future, call it March of next year, that you have two alternative futures uh, and that you can prepare for, for. One of our favorite examples, which we've been talking about lately is the petroleum industry, right? So I think that's a great example, Frank, of there's an industry where there's, you're looking down a tunnel, there's a light and you know the light's not the end of the tunnel, it's a train coming, right? And the world is gonna, the world is gonna change. And if you are Exxon and you've seen what happened with Exxon over the last several months with, you know, um, now I think it's three uh, dissident board members uh, joining the board, um, or you're, uh, you know, you're in the petrochemical business and you're using petrochemicals to make your product, the world's going to change, pricing's going to change, um, the demand for your product is going to change. Um, so it's a, it's a fascinating study because if you look at, um, I think oil's around $70 a barrel today, which is a, a two-year high. The short term is completely disconnected uh, with the long term. The long term is, is very, very clear that something's going to happen. It's very clear if you have, you know, billions or hundreds of billions as ExxonMobil has or BP has, that you have to do something very serious to prepare for this change. Yeah, I would just add that um, the way I normally set it up, Frank, is um, we'll have a time zero event. And in the book, it goes into some depth about how you can generate those, uh, which is essentially you take two uncertainties um, that are real. This gives you a two by two <laughs> of, of four possible futures. And then you write a headline from each future that becomes your time zero event. And then what we recommend is work backward and say before time zero could happen, what would have to be true? Right. So let's say, let's take our, our time zeros that we're playing around with today. So March of 2022, no problem. What would have to be true? Right. We'd have to see uh, increasing evidence that people are vaccinated or have somehow achieved some kind of immunity. We'd have to see that there aren't variants uh, that are increasingly contagious. Uh, we'd have to see that, that you know, good um, regimes in terms of keeping people safe, uh, continue to be adopted. We'd have to see, for example, that children are starting to be protected. Um, and, 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 right? For, for that to be true, there's a lot that would have to happen uh, before we believe in that scenario. And the same with the other scenario. In the other scenario, you know, would, unfortunately, what you'll see is more deadly variants. You'd see people who are unable to or unwilling to, or, you know, just can't get vaccinated for whatever reason, continue to be a large proportion of the population. You'll sort of see localized outbreaks, uh, especially among more vulnerable populations. And the thing about global health is if any of us are affected, all of us are at risk of being affected. So I think that's just really important to remember. So the, the worked model would be you have your time zero and then you work backward looking for indicators. And then a best practice, what we advise our clients is then you set up a little almost call it a council within your organization where everybody has a job. Everybody's looking after an indicator. So let's say uh, Flaminia is looking after the indicator of, you, you know, per, per local region, how many people what percentage of the people are actually vaccinated. And she would track that, right? And now if Ron or I or you come across um, uh, something that that is evidence around that. Now we had now we know who to send it to, right? So we send it to Flaminia. Then we have our little meeting, maybe once every month, once every two months. 
And the purpose of the meeting is not to make decisions. The purpose of the meeting is to make sense of what's going on. So a very similar process to the one that Stan McChrystal used in his uh, fabulous book, Team of Teams, when he was trying to mount a response by a very hierarchical organization, the US military, uh, to a, an enemy that was changing its shape on the ground all the time. And what he found was they needed to create what he calls shared consciousness. And the same is true with these kinds of early warnings. It's not that the data aren't there. The data are always there. It's just they're locked in individual brains. They're spread out somewhere um, where we're not seeing them. So we're not seeing the strategic implications. So Frank just asked a, a follow up, and um, this is Rita's sweet spot. So I'll comment, then I'll turn it over to Rita. Um, <laughs> yeah, he's asking if Exxon and BP will have less freedom so longer they wait to make changes. And the answer to that is absolutely unequivocally that is true. So if you think about their business, um, they uh, pour concrete, they uh, build or uh, lease uh, these massive ships that are as big as small towns. These are assets that have 20, 30, 40 year um, life cycles. So they're spending capital today that they will be depleting over the next 20 to 30 years. So every decision they make today to influence the future locks them into uh, some kind of economic outcome. Another another fascinating area for me, and it's a, it's one of the things that I discuss when I'm coaching CEOs and, and board members, is um, this kind of um, asymmetry between uh, a CEO lifespan or board lifespan compensation and the future. So if you think about some of these industries, and it's one of my favorite topics. Like I'm the CEO of big petroleum company, um, global petroleum company A. And um, I'm going to retire in five years. How do I think about radical change in my organization? And how do I think about preparing my organization for, for an event that is certain to happen in 20 or 30 or 40 years? And the certainty is you won't be selling gasoline to automobiles. So your demand will be down very, very significantly when my compensation is tied to now. In, in the next five years. So a huge cultural problem is a big issue for, for boards. Uh, even board members can think the same way. I'm on the board, I'm gonna be here three years, is all I have to do is not do anything that gets me sued when I leave. And you know, I'll, I'll collect my, uh, my stock uh, compensation. So the cultural aspect of these kind of transformations and the, and the, the personal kind of motivations um, can be very disconnected from a really obvious future state. Rita and I are working with a petrochemical company now, and Rita, I'll let Rita tell the story about this engagement, but it's very, very typical of how some um, organizations operate. Rita, do you want to talk about it? Uh, oh, sure. <laughs> so, toward the end of, it would have been 2020, sort of fall of 2020 um i get this frantic call we really 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 want to work with you you've got to come talk to our board you know we, we want to transform we want to change we want to do all this and it was all like hurry up hurry up hurry up let's get the contract in place let's get this moving um so then frantic pace of meetings like you know hours of meetings every week getting ready for this board lots of research here's what we want to do meeting with the strategy committee meeting with the board advisors meeting i mean they, they were like my whole calendar for about three months there um, and so the big board meeting happens, let's say it was January and uh, we're, we're already right. Like, okay, we got, we got the go ahead, the green light, the board loved it. It was really mind blowing. And they loved the way we talked about their stock price. We loved the way they talked about, you know, their future communication strategy. This is all great. And so we're getting into January and well, there's a lot of work to do to follow up on the board. Okay. So now it gets to be kind of February and, you know, they're kind of looking around and hmm. Quarter's looking a little soft. And we've got this digital transformation thing that we're also trying to worry about. And, and I'm like, look, I'm here, you know, let, let me know. And so there's like two guys that, that I'm working with pretty closely and giving ideas and, you know, doing, doing various activities. But the main, the main attention of the leadership seems to have moved on. So February turns to March, March turns to <laughs> uh, April. And then I get this sort of sheepish call saying, well, we're not sure that we can really act on the things that we talked about because there's all this other stuff going on. So um, we're going to put it on pause. <laughs> I'm thinking to myself, you know, it's fine with me. Like it's your company, but, but all that progress we made, you just know is going to erode. Right. So the enthusiasm, the energy, the momentum is going to erode and then we're going to have to start it up again. And it's going to be back to, you know, back to back crisis meetings when the next 
thing happens. And what's going to happen, I suspect, is the board's going to start to ask pretty pointed questions about, you know, you were talking this great game in January. What, what you know, show us where, where it is. Um, and this is actually something Ron and I are working on a lot, which is how do we create consistency across the management of a portfolio? And it is one of the perennial frustrations when you go into a large, complicated company and you say to them something very innocuous, like, so, so what are you guys working on? <laughs> you know, once you dig into that question, what becomes pretty clear is nobody knows. And so one of the things we've been building, and, and it's I've been doing it manually for years, but we're, we're working on this tool to kind of make it a little easier to figure out what's where at what stage, but more importantly, to capture information about it as it's developing. So you don't get this mythology about what actually happened in, in the company. And you've got some idea about who's working on what and 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 to what end. And it's not, not to try to impose layers of control. It's just to create a reality around what is it that we've actually learned? What is it we're actually doing? And um, we have, we're excited about it. I think it's, it's a, a, it could be a bit, a bit of a breakthrough. So I'm, I'm keen on it. Um, it, was that sort of what you had in mind, Ron, for me to talk yeah, about? Yeah, it absolutely was. There's, a, there's now a question here. It's like, can you apply this framework to product development and early stage entrepreneurship? And I, I think the answer is absolutely. I'm going to talk about product development, Rita, and I'll let you okay. uh, talk about entrepreneurship. Okay. And we're all, what I'll talk about in product development is um, I actually just posted this morning the story of Minidisc and Sony and you know, how well, that, you should probably tell them a little bit about yourself now that I'm thinking oh, yeah, about it. Because I don't think I did a very good job introducing <laughs> you. <laughs> well, I, um, thank you, Rita. I grew up at Sony, so I spent uh, probably about half of my career at Sony, um, you know, in various roles. Um, but ultimately... Well, you, were, you were there when it really grew, right? I mean, you were there for I was there, Yeah, when I joined Sony, it was about a billion-dollar company. When I left, it was about a $30 billion company. Um, which was uh, a fantastic ride. And it's still, a, 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 still many, many, many of my closest friends are still Sony people in the Sony world. So it was a great ride. Um, and um, um, I got to do a lot of things that um, if the company wasn't growing that fast, I probably wouldn't have got to do. And one of them was run the, the personal um, uh, mobile products company. So uh, back in the day, that was the Walkman company. Um, and a mini disc was one of the products. And I, I, you know, if you go to my LinkedIn, you'll see a little story on, on mini disc and, and kind of what happened there. But the question is, can you apply this framework to, um, to, um, product development? Um, so beyond, beyond Sony, I then went out into retail. I was at Best Buy during one of their transformations, which is really exciting. And I've also done a lot of work in private equity. Uh, with a number of transformations in private equity and um, some very successful and some not so successful because that's how the world goes. Um, I want to talk about from a product development standpoint, um, you know, there are a couple of really interesting ways to think about this. So when, when I first got into product uh, on, the, on the Sony side, the compact disc was still a really big thing, right? And uh, it was going to be eventually replaced by pure digital audio. And it was very, very clear to the music industry, it was very, very clear to Sony that this was going to happen. But the question becomes, how do you prepare for that? And how do you, how do you truly think through that? Um, and the mini disc article touches on some of these things. So if you, those of you who are older than Flaminia, God bless you, Flaminia, probably <laughs> never owned a CD player. Um, understand, <laughs> understand oh, that, that the, the, the digitization of audio was a terrifying thing for the music industry because it meant you could now, once it's ones and zeros, it's quite easy to, to, to photocopy a, a CD. Um, so the industry spent a lot of time trying to constrain the, the, the free movement of music while the uh, electronics industry wanted to sell devices that could, you know, copy and replicate, uh, music. And it was very, very clear to see that there was a point at which where broadband was going to get fast enough, the internet was going to get fast enough, that truly downloading and streaming music was going to happen. But it wasn't clear as when that point was or what the business model was. Um, so the, throughout the 90s, there was a huge number of failed attempts to control music. One was um, called the Secure Digital Music Initiative. If you ever want to have your head explode, go to Wikipedia and read about that one. I lived through that for about five years, um, which essentially was an industry trying to put a digital wrapper around everything in the world. And of course that never worked. And ultimately the people who solved this problem were not in the music industry and were in fact 
not in the portable music device industry. And it was a little fruit company called Apple that came up with this thing called an iPod and, um, and, and, and Apple Music. And they were able to do it because they, in, 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 from my perspective, they were free of the constraints of thought and free of the constraints of, of the conflicts within uh, the music and electronics industry. If you think about Sony, Sony actually owned both pieces. They owned the biggest record company in the world and the biggest electronics company in the world. And we could not talk to each other. I actually participated, actually proposed a product called Music Station in Japan, which almost got me fired, um, that said we can combine these things and make digital recordings and sell them. And I proposed that in 1999. And you guys know that the iPod wasn't even introduced until four or five years later. So we were ahead, but we couldn't execute because we culturally could not get out of our own way. Uh, and frankly, the idea was probably a little bit too uh, early, um, but you absolutely unequivocally, it was obvious to everyone in the industry that this was coming. What was not obvious was, and was not really well thought out in my opinion, was all the optionality. And Rita can talk about platforms and stepping stones as um, and, uh, something that she's written a lot about, that those platforms and stepping stones were not developed and were not worked. And therefore somebody on the outside just did it. Yeah. Yeah. That, I mean, that's, that's an amazing story. I remember um, there was an article that came out and I want to say it was as long ago as 1984. Um, and it was talking, the title of the article was the civil war inside Sony. And yep. the article made the point that, you know, you had the hardware people and they wanted all the st content to be free. You had the content people and they wanted the hardware to be free. <laughs> you know? and, then you had, and then you sort of had the distribution people who didn't care what happened as long as they got their act together and you had something to sell. And nobody talked to each other. So absolutely, absolutely um, um, uh, difficult. Um, so let's talk a little bit about entrepreneurship, because I think, um, it, it, yes, you can definitely apply this model to entrepreneurship with, with true oh. entrepreneurship. What I mean by that is when you're creating a new category. So I'm not talking about opening up like a franchise dry cleaning business, which is also entrepreneurship. I'm not denigrating it, but I'm saying if you're truly creating a new kind of category. And the case I'll use here is the case of Jim McKelvey, who's been, been a fireside guest. And he was one of the co-founders of the product that later became Square. And, um, and basically it's, you know, making, an, making a phone a credit card. And the reason he thought about this product, and it was not his first business, he was, he's actually a glassblower. He's a very highly skilled and highly trained glassblower. And he was in the process of packing up his studio in one part of the country to move it to another. And there was this huge, really ugly piece of glass that he, he didn't know what to do. You know, he didn't really like it. And he finally found a buyer for it. And he was just thrilled. But it turns out this buyer, uh, was a woman who wanted to pay for this thing on her American Express card. And he couldn't accept American Express cards. You know, he was a very small business at the time. And, you know, tiny little businesses can't afford interchange fees. They can't afford the overhead of what it takes to be accredited as a vendor. And, and you know, Amex is expensive. I mean, <laughs> for years, they the, many people didn't carry them because they were so expensive to wear. So he lost the sale. And this sparked in him a passion to figure out why couldn't we make a credit card product that would work for people like him that would work for small vendors. And in, in his, he's got a wonderful book called The Innovation Stack, which I can highly recommend to any of you that are interested in um, uh, innovation. I can also recommend watching our fireside chat, which you'll find on YouTube. Um, he he's just tells the story in a wonderful way. But what he talks about is that any existing regime bumps up against a wall. And if you think about it as venturing out into unknown territory, there comes a point where what's known comes to an end. And it comes to an end, I would argue, this is my language, not his, but it comes to an end because there's some breakthrough, there's some barrier, there's some inflection point that has not yet happened. And what these true entrepreneurs do is they really think about what would it take to break through that? Like, what is the inflection point I would have to create or leverage to break through that? And McKelvey talks about all the things they had to do to turn the phone into a credit card. And there's a whole chapter on how you how you get regulated as a credit card provider. And then there's the technology, right? Because those of you that know the square reader, it's a tiny little square that you plug into the, the 
part of your phone that used to have the headphones in it, which doesn't anymore. But and I guess now they plug it into wherever the charging thing is. But, um, you know, they had to make this really thin, really attractive looking device. They had to um, solve all these problems. And so what I think how the model applies in entrepreneurship is you've got your time zero, which is this thing's in everybody's hands. And I, and, you know, and my, my brother who does plumbing can accept credit card payments. Uh, that's the vision. That's the time zero. But what we have to do is break through all these barriers to do it. And in the book, McKelvey talks about how Amazon literally tried to take them out. They had a, a I think it was called neighborhood, something like that. I forget what the Amazon reader was, but, you know, he said he, he would go to bed at night, like sweating bullets, because my God, one of the best financed, most aggressive, best run companies on the planet is coming after your little startup. And he said, we talked about it. We spoke about it. We, we, we went back and forth and back and forth as a leadership team trying to figure out what are we going to do? And then we decided to do absolutely nothing differently because we had solved all these problems that Amazon didn't even know existed yet. And eventually after about, I think it took about a year, but after about a year, Amazon folded. They just said, we, we, we can't compete with this startup that's so laser focused on solving this series of problems. And in what I thought was a, quite a nice gesture to the customers, when Amazon decided to pull out of this business, they bought square readers for all of their customers sent them, sent the Square readers in a beautiful little box with a note saying, we think you'll be better serviced by working with Square. And, you know, fascinating story. But again, you've solved these problems in ways that are not copyable by somebody who hasn't had that experience. And so that's how I would relate it to this sort of category creating flavor of entrepreneurship. So the question here is, can you, um, what do you think uh, people working for Kodak should have done differently? This is from Frank as well. Oh, hey, Frank. <laughs> we should get you on the screen here. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, Kodak. So I have to tell you a very personal story. So um, my, my dad worked at Kodak um, for many, many years and um, had a whole group of contemporaries. So my dad is um, a world class, what was a world class um, selenium tellurium organic chemist. That was his passion. And, um, and he's got, he has over a hundred patents to his name. I mean, you know, super brilliant guy. And he belonged to this whole cadre of, of scientists and people that work together and people that solve these really, really thorny technological problems. Um, and just last weekend, uh, they had a bit of a reunion. Uh, and I was invited because part of the agenda was they were going to talk about my dad, who unfortunately passed away early this year, but they were going to tell stories about him and talk about him and, and sort of share tales. And of course, these are all guys who were in the R&D group at Kodak. And Oh, I've got to write this up because the stories they told about the inventions that were in the labs, the, the breakthroughs that they had made, the, you know, they invented color copying before it was even a thing, right? They invented, um, uh, they invented breakthroughs around a uh, uh, transmission of, of digital signals that, that nobody could match. And they, as they described it, they said, you know, we'd invent this stuff in the labs and we could see. Like we could see how this was going to break through these barriers, how it could create an inflection point where it would go. And we'd go to headquarters and they'd say things like, well, what, there's no market for that. And they'd go, all right, that's the point. There's no market for it. And, and headquarters would be like, well, we can't sell something. How do we tell our sales force to sell something into a market that doesn't exist? Um, and, and so it was just this you know, vision for the future, this kind of entrepreneurial breaking through those barriers, crossing the barren territory and figuring out how to make it go absolutely meets, you know, Kodak Liferdom at headquarters and they just wouldn't go for it. Um, and there was a great story, Ron, you'll appreciate this one, um, which they told at, at the time of uh, there was the Olympics, which was in, I guess it must have been in Tokyo. And the Olympic Committee was uh, asking for sponsorship. And what they were looking for was about $4 billion. And Kodak said, no, no, we've got the big brand. You know, we're, we're, we're not going for it. We'll give you two. And uh, Fujifilm, uh, which at the time did not have much of a brand name, did not have much of a presence, you know, in, in ordinary people's imagination. Fujifilm said, we'll give you three and a half. So the Olympic Committee went with Fuji. Of course, this is a global event, right? And Kodak's attitude was, well, fine, you know, we'll, we're Kodak, we can live without you. But what that did was it opened the world's eyes to the fact that Fuji even existed. And it created the inroads through which Fuji was able to establish global partnerships and become in many parts of the world, 
in the heyday of film, uh, near equal to Kodak in, in, in terms of revenue and, and scope. And then, of course, Fuji was a lot smarter about getting into digital than, than Kodak was. Kodak was afraid of it. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the Kodak people. But they also <laughs> developed um, much more affordable mini labs. So in the early days of mini labs, the Kodak mini lab was, say, $100,000 and Fuji was forty. <laughs> so it was a really interesting. There's an interesting little question. I think it's a great blog for you, Rita, is like, why did Kodak not become 3M? Why did 3M become this innovation factory, this mining company, um, when Kodak had these great scientists and they did not? There's some reason for that. That, that mm -hmm. I think is very interesting. Yeah, and it's also interesting that like today we tend to lay the blame at oh economic short termism and income inequality and stock buybacks and yeah. th none of that was there in Codex you know period of of glory and its period of decline and fall. So it, there's a different explanation, and I think it really does come down to um, a couple of things. You know, the mindset of people running organizations, you know, is often totally inimical to the mindset required to run something that's new. And I think what happened at Kodak was you had a, a whole thermal layer of managers who just, you know, you have a product with 65% profit margins and you've dominated that for decades and you get really, really good at what I call the exploit part of the product life cycle. Um, and what I would argue is we need to build organizations today that are good at the innovation growth, uncharted waters, let's create the breakthroughs, let's do that entrepreneurial thing. So that's where new advantages come from. Yes, you've got to have people that are great at running the thing. I mean, that's obvious that yeah, that's where you get your returns. But then you've got to have people who are good at that transformation and change thing. Because if you think about innovation is coming in waves, you know, what was innovation becomes exploitation, becomes transformation. And I think the leaders of the future aren't going to need to get really good at, at all of that. And that's actually one of the reasons I'm so excited to be working with Ron, because I know a lot about that first part. That's where I've spent my, my whole life is, you know, unicorns and fairy dust and let's invent the next big thing. <laughs> I'm a lot less experienced when it comes to, okay, that was great. That thing is now, you know, heading heading stage left. What what do we do with the company at that point? And Ron's had a tremendous amount of experience at that. So it's it's been really interesting to bounce perspectives off each other as we build this set of offerings. Uh, so there's some questions here from uh, Frank as well. We should have him as a panelist. Um, <laughs> I don't think I've ever met Frank. <laughs> uh, I really like this fireside concept, why one demand uh, oriented, focused on questions. Thank you. Uh, driven by great technology such as Zoom, YouTube, Instagram, Twitter. Question: Can you uh, relate, please? Changes hey, Frank. happening, and <laughs> oh, we're adding Frank. <laughs> add Frank. Why not? He's a very Happening loyal fireside visitor. Learning education to your early learning model. I, this is a great question, Frank, because Rita um, talks about this all the time as it relates to Columbia and executive education and everything happening in the digital space. So. Hi, Frank. <laughs> Welcome to the panel. I, 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 put him, I put him on the spot. I don't think he knew he was going to get promoted to panelist. <laughs> we're, we're, we're lucky he's not sitting in uh, you know, his, his bathroom or his swimming pool. Or <laughs> <laughs> he did have the right to decline. He didn't have to accept. Yeah, he did not have to accept. That's true. You can't force him into the panel. But. Yeah, so let's talk about education. And um, I'll talk about something that we've done at Columbia, which I think is pretty forward thinking. And then something I'm working on, you know, just aside from that. Um, so at Columbia, you know, so here we were February of 2020 and, you know, looking at, I don't know, $19 million worth of business, right? Which we booked basically, because our, our, the in-person exec ad market is a really long cycle market. Uh, and that just went poof. <laughs> And so after about two weeks of sort of saying, what do we do? I, I, I sat down with our dean and I said, look, I, you know, people are not going to stop needing to learn and executives are not going to stop needing to be developed. And this is going to be a need there. We've just got to figure out some different way of doing it. So what we pivoted to was what we're calling live online. And uh, so it's this kind of format, actually, very discussion oriented with, um, you know, the usual cast of professors. And we learned a bunch of things. So one of the things we learned was that there's an absolute hunger for it. Second thing we learned was that um, that that we broadened the, the 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 population of people that could that we could serve you know that could come and join us because 
It didn't matter if you were in Hong Kong or Malaysia or Nigeria or wherever, you could dial in as long as you had an internet connection, which even then was a little dicey for some folks. We had people on the phone, you know, <laughs> there was a big wind. <laughs> Um, so we learned we could reach a lot more people. We also learned that we could experiment with different formats. So rather than everybody comes to New York and we hang out for three days and you know, it's fire hose. Um, for example, with um, one of my courses, um, I extended it over a number of weeks. And so it was less intense during the week, but spread out longer. So you could actually take the concepts and apply them and then come back and talk about what you did and ask questions about what you were learning. So it integrated the learning much more with people's work. And I actually think that model is going to continue even once we're able to have in-person classes again, because I think it meets a different need, you know, that that, that learners have. So let me talk a little bit about um, what, what I'm working on. And it's a concept that really is about, uh, so, so give a little bit of context. So we have a, a, a technology we're working on. It's software, but don't, don't think of it as a software offering. It's basically a guide. It, it's sort of a spine to let's say learning something new. And it takes you through a series of checkpoints and the idea would be that, let's say one of the checkpoints is figuring out customer segmentation. Um, well, let's say you don't know anything about customer segmentation, or the last time you had it was in your MBA program 15 years ago, and you were still doing four Ps for marketing, um, and you really want to get up to speed on it. Well, the sort of existing approaches would say, oh, go off to Columbia, you know, get on a plane, sit in our classroom, learn what you can, and go back and try to figure it out when you get back home. So my, my thought, and this is really the whole Valise concept, right, is how do I bring this to the organization so that people can benefit from it where they are? You know, they don't have to go somewhere. And so the idea is you'd be hitting this, this part of the system, which sort of says, you know, customer segmentation, click here, and it takes you to an inventory of learning resources, some of which are going to be you know, little short videos, maybe recordings of something, some of which are going to be downloadable, you know, here's a checklist, here's a form, here's a video of Rita actually doing a customer interview, here's the five things to avoid when you're doing a customer interview. So it allows you in, you know, an hour sort of format to get smarter about that, then you come back and you do the work. And then you kind of iterate backwards and forwards, bring what you need to learn. And then maybe, maybe down the road, there'll be like a badging function where I could say, hey, you know, Frank, took the module, answered the quiz. He's now a level five, you know, competent person. And so late you know, down the road, when I'm thinking about who do I staff on a venture or who do I pull together to work on a transformation project or who I can now see what course they've taken, you know, what skill they've exhibited, what measures they are. And so it gives me that level of, wow, you know, this person I might not have thought about because they weren't in my circle of people. Uh, and I can now reach out and, and pull them into this project that I'm working on. I also think that could be great for, for example, for the diversity agenda, because a lot of times you know, we have this human natural tendency to connect to the people that we know, but there may be very capable people who we don't know, but who have the skills that we need. And so wouldn't it be cool if we could see that across our organization? So that's what we're working on. And I'm, I'm, as you can tell, I'm really excited about it, but it's this idea of learning. I mean, and I still think there'll be a role for executive education in it from an education point of view, but I think this idea of learning when you need to, as you need to in a structured way, I think that's got a very powerful alternative approach. So what are you thinking about uh, financing? I see this, this uh, fireside chat is great, but you know it's free. And how how do you, how do you make it work? Do you have sponsors, or um, when when learning becomes more you know integrated, we can easily how do we work out new financing models in education that work for everyone? Yeah, so Frank, I think when you when you accepted the the panelist, we build your visa card two thousand dollars. So thank you. <laughs> Talk about hardball, Ron. Jeez, you're going to freak people out. <laughs> now, what we're thinking about doing is, um, if you think about the funds that are available, let's say for innovation, you know, there'll be some kind of project budget. And right now, if you wanted to buy tools, right? So you wanted to subscribe to IdeaScale, or you wanted to get a piece of software that helps you do, I don't know, whatever. Um, I think there'll be a budget, something like that, right? And my guess is some of it will come out of the consulting budget. You know, the, the, like, so let's just make this up. So let's say you came to Ron and myself and you said, I've got this pro program. I want to figure out what haptic technology means for the future of holography. We'd be like, okay. <laughs> so, um, and, 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 you know, we'd be, I'd really like you guys to work with it, work with me on doing that. So what we could do is just say, okay, you know, here's like a consulting fee for that, that project. Um, we'll set it up in a six month period. If you're happy with how it's going, you know, we'll, 
continue. If you're not, we stop. Uh, but I think it'll be finance something like that. I think it'll be more of a services model is my guess. But then there's also going to be a lot of free stuff around it, right? You know, because part of my role in life is to do research and discover new things. And, and so I could imagine there'll be a free layer, which anybody can tap into. And then if you want more hands-on, more intensive help, then there'll be a paid layer. Similar to, right, I'd say, um, I'll, 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 the analogy I'll draw is to when I give speeches and stuff, right? Um, some of it's free. <laughs> this is not for charge. And some of it's expensive because you're having an event or you're having people or you want your senior leadership team uh, to do it. So I think it'll be something like that. In, in relating to that, um, uh, Marianne had a question about entrepreneurial growth in innovation in the area of professional services, which I think is a related to kind of where Frank's going, because obviously what we do is professional service. Um, I can start on this, Rita, and give you my yeah. views. And, uh, but I, I, I think what's happened with the pandemic has really been um, a massive opportunity for innovation professional services. So there's a, there's a group that I've been associated with called the Chameleon Collective, for example. And they were a virtual and still are a virtual um, marketing company. Um, and um, they don't have an office anywhere in the world. They have, I think, over 200 uh, employees now in their business. I, I can't give you the numbers because they're a private company, but the, their business exploded during the pandemic because things like Zoom and, and digital conferences and, um, you know, companies figuring out that, um, and Rita and I are associated with another services company that has figured out that their clients has figured out that you don't have to fly somebody to their office every week to have them do coding. They can actually do coding from anywhere on the planet. So their costs have dropped dramatically. Their business is up and their profit is way up. And the people using these digital tools and frankly, the cultural adaptation of the tools, right? So I don't have to be sitting. Uh, my daughter is going to work for a major global bank this summer. She graduated from Villanova University. Thank you very much. Magna cum laude. Thank you very much. And um, yeah, she did very well. She's never met anyone at the bank. She did her internship last summer virtual. She did all her interviews this year virtual. She starts, I think, next week virtual. She may not even meet a person at the bank until January of next year. So the world has changed. And how you, you know, if you think about a Japanese bank thinking, well, I don't have to meet you to hire you. Having grown up at a Japanese company, I can tell you that's amazing, <laughs> right? So the world in services is changing uh, uh, Marianne, uh, quite uh, dramatically. And Rita, I don't know if you want to add to that. Or Frank, well, you can add to that, Joe. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll <laughs> chime in, and, and Frank may have a perspective as well. Um, I mean, the fact that Flamini is here is a, a great gift yep. uh, of the great pandemic example. to me. I mean, my, you know, I'm always traveling. In the pre, pre times, I would always be traveling. I would be in my New York office, you know, once every couple of weeks. I'd be on site, you know, teaching or working with clients. Um, and so I could never have an intern because for many years, the presumption of sponsoring an intern was you'd be there and they'd be with you and you'd, you know, they'd, they'd watch what you did and they got to sit in on meetings and all that stuff. Um, and so uh, Flaminia's sister actually, who happened to be studying with someone who I guess is a, a fan of mine, um, just wrote to me out of the blue and said, would I, would I have an internship? And I wrote her back and I said, look, you look terrifically well qualified. I'd love to, but I, you know, understand I don't have an office and I don't have any of the normal things interns expect. And she said, oh, that's all right. I'll be spending the summer in Italy. <laughs> I was like done. <laughs> and then uh, Flaminia uh, is her sister. And uh, so the two of them worked uh, over the summer and uh, Flaminia has now joined us full time, but we've never met in person. We've met <laughs> Zoom like, but you know, that kind of unlocking of talent, if you think about it, that that's unprecedented. The, the fact that you can make these connections and leverage those resources. Um, and, you know, clearly I'm not watching over her shoulder with a stopwatch wondering what she's doing because, you know, one of us is asleep and <laughs> during at least part of the other's working hours. So it just doesn't, doesn't, I, it, it, it's a whole new model for how we, we do things. So, um, so Rita, we have about nine minutes. Okay. So I'll encourage anybody else in the chat, if you have any uh, follow on questions, if, please drop them in there. You, um, we can post our um, contact info again. I guess I'll put, it in, I'll put it in the chat so people can grab it in case mm -hmm. they wanna reach out after this. Um, so Ron, a um, couple of things I do wanna talk about a little bit on this theme of time zero. Um, 
because we've been talking to a lot of smart people about what comes next. And we may be past the pandemic, but let's remember people have been at home, you know, out of the company of other human beings in many, many cases for a long time. Now we're going to go out no masks, in contact with everybody and their germs in a joyous celebration of life. But, you know, the flu has not gone away. (laughs) Other infectious diseases have not gone away. The cold season, which was very mild this past year, has not gone away. And so even if it's not coronavirus, I think we can anticipate that there are going to be, you know, serious help issues that become apparent uh, once we're all back to, you know, socializing and being in person. And, you know, and and masks have become sort of, in some places, really socially unacceptable. You're treated as weird if you wear one, not in lot, not in par- parts of the world, but in parts of the world, you really are. And I'm actually thinking, you know, it has been so nice not to have my annual kind of three days in bed with a flu kind of experience that I have every year. Because, you know, when you travel a lot and you're on airplanes a lot and you're in airports a lot, you're going to get something. It's just a matter of time. And so, you know, maybe maybe there's a population like that that's going to take more precautions as we go forward. So I'll be interested to see how that plays out. I'm thinking, you know, how I'm, I've talked to so many people that really liked working at home mm-hmm. and they found they could do more focused, concentrated work, and they, they would not get disturbed, and they could make their, you know, family life also work better. So I'm thinking, you know, how many offices do we need? Um, well, are we going back to this, uh, to this, you know, offices, uh, open offices, or what are we, what are we doing? Well, that's the big question. And, you know, I have seen every variety of hypothesis that I can imagine on that. So we're seeing some CEOs, um, uh, Jamie Dimon uh, of JP Morgan Chase, the people at Goldman Sachs basically saying, absolutely not, we're done with this work at home thing. We need everybody in the office. And we're also seeing the whole backlash. There are there were several articles in, in both the Wall Street Journal and the Times talking about how for a lot of people, they're like, uh, no. And there was a great profile of a young woman who was told, you know, had to be in the office, really important meeting. So gets up early, drops her child at daycare, you know, does the hair, the makeup, the whole thing, you know, puts on the business suit, drives to the office for a meeting that lasted exactly six minutes. And she said, that was it. That was it. I handed in my papers that afternoon. (laughs) I found another job that would do remote and I'm gone. I'm out of there. So I think this unrealistic expectation, not this expectation that is born from a time when you had a very different way of managing people um, is going to be really different. And people that grew up digital, you know, as as a a younger friend of mine said to me, look, (laughs) I can understand why the partners want to be, you know, in the office because they're in meetings all day long and where they want to be able to schmooze with the client and go and have lunch down the hall and, you know, everything. The rest of us, we're putting together PowerPoint decks all day long. You know, I sit in the office with my headphones on. Why do I need to be there? (laughs) I can do PowerPoint decks here just as easily as I can do it there. So there's this fascinating kind of tension about what is work and what is creative work. Um, I do think there's something about human contact. And Ron, I'd love you to weigh in on this because you've experimented with all kinds of flavors of this, um, is, um, you know, this ability to build trust and to really be together, together sort of in the trenches. And when you're there all night, you get the deliverable just over the finish line right before the deadline. And there's something exhilarating and very human about that. Um, I don't know if that can be replicated virtually. Maybe it can. Um, I do know that, that it's, it's, it's important to build trusting relationships for certain kinds of really complex problem solving. Yeah, and I think that's true. I think what's going to happen truly, and, I, and it's interesting that the, the people playing the most brass knuckle kind of tactics are in the financial services industry. Shocking, right? So I, I think the answer is going to be yes. It's going to be both. So, I, you know, I, I think about some of the, the events, you know, if I go, way back uh, when we were doing our transformation and turn around at Brookstone, one of the things that we found out was that the website provider that we had was, you want to talk about time zero, um, basically on July 1 was going to close the doors. And we found this out in January-ish. And so we had to, you know, you know, buy ATG and code a, a very complex, very large website in a matter of three or four months. And it turned into a 24 hour day, seven day a week kind of thing where, you know, I as a CEO would, you know, show up at three o'clock in the morning with a stack of pizzas 
Um, and I think it it was transformational for the for the company on a, on a number of uh, in a number of ways. But nobody wants to live like that. I mean, those people literally had to have a month off after that to just find their families and and be human again. Um, and I think that's kind of what um, one of my sons went to work for one of the largest global banks right out of Boston College. And I said, if you take the job, you have to take it for two years and you know you're in the worst industry with the worst company. So don't come to me and tell me you want to quit in six months. And six months into it, he said, this is the most miserable place I've ever worked in my life. We made him stay two years. He kept his commitment. Now he's started his own business and he's in very successful. And he and a bunch of his friends started a business in July of last year. They, they don't have an office. They don't meet their clients in person. It's all on Zoom. Um, they're starting now to go out and, and be in the physical world. But I, I think it's going to be both. I think it's an and. Um, because you do need, you know, we are the creatures that pick the, the shiny pebble from the stream. We're very tribal. We're very tactical. tactile. Um, um, but we also want to be in our cave once in a while and be left alone. And I think it's going to be both. Yeah, I think the hardest thing to navigate is going to be um, this hybrid, right? And it's like, I mean, we've experimented with this already with teaching. Like, I can optimize teaching for screen. You know, there's ways we can get people engaged and have conversations and be invested in each other. And I can optimize teaching in the classroom. I mean, that's easy. I've done that all my life. Um, it is impossible to get a really fulfilling experience if you're trying to do both. And a lot of a lot of universities are doing this where they'll have like 25% of the students in the class because the students want it right? They, they want to be with each other. That's what they want. <laughs> the professor is just kind of, you know, the proximate cause for us being in this room together, but we want to be in the room together. And so I think, you know, we're learning a lot of interesting things about what works and what doesn't. Um, this is this is great. So Ron, um, folks that want to know more, uh, get to know us where, you know, we, our emails are in the chat. If you want to know more about what we're doing, if you want to understand more about what we're building at Belize, I'll talk to anybody who will listen to me. <laughs> Because it's been a long time. I mean, I've been working on this now for five years and have not found the formula yet. Uh, so we're working on it. Um, but, you know, it's coming along. And, and I think there are some really nice tools that are being built that I think could be really helpful. And we're trying to make it back to your question, Rank, about, about economics. We're trying to make it accessible, you know, at one end and then, you know, more bespoke for those that need or want a more intensive level of help. And I think that's what we're working on now. Yep. And so the whole purpose of Belize is to take Rita's brilliant com concepts that uh, from end of competitive advantage, discovery driven growth, seeing around corners and, and uh, use some of my experience and other people's experience as well to bring them out and solve real problems for real people in the real world. And we're very, we're doing some of that and it's a lot of fun. So uh, if you want to talk more about that, our contact info is in there. We're out there on the web. It'd be hard not to find Rita. She's <laughs> like, uh, you don't, it's not a blind squirrel and acorn thing. She's everywhere. So you can find her on the internet uh, if you need her and we'd be happy to help you if you, uh, if you need our help. That's great. Hey, this is terrific. Um, alignment of culture in hybrid work and organizations. Um, so Bogdan, I'll answer that one quickly. And then I think we need to respect people's time and let, let folks get back to their day. This has been fun though. We should do these more often. <laughs> sure, we should do this every once in a while. This yeah. is great. Yeah, so we can have guest that, hosts like Frank come on. <laughs> <laughs> totally. <laughs> now that we know him, you know, so we'll get to know you virtually, Frank, and we'll build up trust, you know, and then you can be part of the happy tribe. Um, so, Bogdan, um, I'd like to go back to some work that was done uh, at MIT by a guy named David uh, Allen. And he was interested in studying the research productivity of researchers. And the thing he was interested in was how much information gets shared by these people. And one of his independent variables was how far away from one another were they sitting? Interesting. It shows you what professors get up to, right? But what he found was a super interesting graph. So if you imagine the vertical dimension is information richness. So how much information got shared and processed and used and how much did they bounce ideas off each other? And the horizontal dimension was how far apart they were sitting from each other, physically sitting at work. Um, and he found a line that kind of went like this, like this, like this, very rich, very rich, very rich, and then fell off a cliff. And what he concluded was that by the time you have a group that is literally sitting more than 60 feet, about 20 meters apart, 
the, the flow of information just comes to a choke point. And so the conclusion from that study, and that was done years ago, is if you're sitting more than 60 feet from another person, you have to be much more intentional about the communications. So Bogdan, to come to your question, I think you need to work on it. And it takes, like, culture kind of happens if you're hanging around the office. And one of, one of our clients said it to us, that she's working on an innovation program. And she said, you know, we're all sitting together. So we all know what was going on. Now, every day is a meeting, <laughs> right? And so when you're together, there's just this natural flow. But when you're farther apart, you have to be much more intentional. So you have to structure things like, let's have a cultural conversation. You have to structure things like, for today, we're going to go around the room and we're going to talk about early warnings. We're going to talk about, you know, um, how do we handle it when one member of the team can't be part of a call that's scheduled for whatever reason? You know, do we record it and then they catch up later? Do we say, no, 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 we have all got to be. I mean, how are we going to do this? And, and I think you have to be much more explicit and intentional if you're building a hybrid culture. I'll leave you with a great example that you should look up. Um, so there's a company called Buffer, which is one of my all time favorite startup stories. And Buffer was started virtual, went to sort of in-person, found that that cut them off from a lot of would-be talent and created all kinds of problems. So then they went hybrid and then they abandoned hybrid. They said, it's just too difficult. Like we can optimize for virtual, that works great. We can optimize for in-person, that works great. The hybrid thing is just, it's just causing so much extra work. It's just not worth it. And I thought that was interesting. So they are, they have a very active blog. Um, their CEO is a, a great guy and is very open about the decisions he makes as a manager. So the company's buffer, look them up. Um, I think you'll find them really interesting. Well, so thank you, everybody. This has really been fun. Thank you, Ron, for jumping in at the last minute. And Flaminia, um, enjoy your birthday and have a great time in Tuscany. And uh, we'll see you all next week. Uh, next thank week's you. fireside you. is, uh, is um, David Duncan from Innocite's going to talk about why customers should not be a mystery. So thanks, Ron. Thanks, everybody. This is great.